I'm Jensie Bingham. I am a Putnam County native, Greencastle resident, legally resident in Greencastle all my life. My family's got here. My paternal ancestors were all here for the 1830 census. So I have grown up with the county of Putnam, the, the city of Greencastle. Professionally, I'm the first woman in Indiana who ever went out and bought a radio station and ran the things. The radio station is still on the air. I'm barely hanging on to my life. Uh, professionally, that was my life story. Personally, I am uh, kind of an old windbag who's interested in the county area and its history. And I'd like to talk about what Greencastle used to be like in the 1940s. And as I look back and started thinking about my grade school experience and thought that that was 80 years ago. I can't believe it, 80 years ago. 80 years ago, Greencastle City did not have a kindergarten, but some of the city parents got together and hired a lady to have a private kindergarten in her home. That house still stands on East Washington Street not too far from where now Greencastle High School is. So when we all started to the first grade, many of us had had some experience and we could count and tell people who we were and those kinds of things. And I lost two baby teeth. That is my biggest memory of kindergarten when the grandson of the Coca-Cola plant people in Greencastle came through a hedge and knocked out my two front teeth. At a later class reunion, some 50 or 60 years later, he swears he doesn't remember it. Well, he's not the one that got all bloody. I was terrified. Oh, look at all this blood. But teeth grew in, so that was fun. And another fun thing was that, you know, 13 years later, many of those kids who had gone to kindergarten together graduated together from Greencastle High School. We had three elementary schools in Greencastle in the 1940s. Miller School, which is now an apartment building, Miller Asbury. Mary Emma Jones School, the same name but a different building as the Jones School, which now is on Liberty Street but unoccupied as a building for education and the Ridpath School, named for Putnam County ed educators, the Ridpaths, which is now the site of the brand new or newer Ridpath grade school. And it was also the site of Greencastle High School way, way back when. The high school was on Spring Street and it is now Spring Tree Apartments. Uh, and the old gym is now a parking lot behind St. Paul the Apostle Catholic Church. So the grade schools were grades one through six. There was not bus service for kids who lived in town. You had to walk to school or if you lived, kids in Northwood were a long way from Second Ward Miller School and sometimes the parents drove them. I live uh, on Bloomington Street, so I was two blocks from grade school and two blocks from high school, except for the first year when we moved to town. Now that move would not be considered moving to town now because it's in town. But in 1940, my grandpa's farm was at 837 Indianapolis Road and his barn stood where Headley Hardware is now. That was the edge of town on the north side of what was then called the Stilesville Road. Now, Commercial Place, which is called the Avenues, was already established and there were houses there uh, built for a lot of people who were working at the old zinc mill. And the zinc mill stood where the Greencastle License Branch is and went all the way back to where Mill Pond Health Campus is. So we had three schools, grades one through six, and the junior high and high school were both in the 
same location at Spring Street. The, the curriculum was basically the same. We, we had Latin. Uh, I didn't take Latin uh, because I couldn't think of what I would ever use it for. We all had to take algebra, and I must confess, I'm going to be 85 years old in about 10 days, and I have never, ever found a use for a quadratic equation. And my educator son looked over his glasses at me one day, and he said, you had to learn that because you had to learn how to think. Well, I didn't mind learning how to think for geometry, but X and Y might as well have been on Saturn. Uh, I just never did care much for that. But the best part of freshman algebra was I was in an all-girl class, and we had a student teacher from DePauw. His name was Norman Hake, and he lived at the old Lambakai house, which is now Avon Apartments, which now has uh, it's the Valerian now. And we all thought Mr. Hake was an import from heaven, so we did make an effort. Uh, but we had a good time at school. We were clicky and clanny. Basketball was a big thing. Greencastle had had an unfortunate death of a football player back in the 20s and did not play football again until along about 1950. And football took up again, which was wonderful for me because I was in the band. <coughs> Excuse me. And the band got to have halftime shows at the football game. And we, the band, practiced marching on Poplar Street just south of the school. And uh, we didn't do anything really intricate, but we made a lot of noise and thought we were pretty good. Uh, we had an excellent music program. We had a wonderful art program. But the, the best thing and the funniest thing I always thought was the chemistry department was in the northwest corner of Greencastle High School. And we always figured if there was an explosion there, uh, it would just take off that corner of the high school and, and the rest of it would be indestructible. So when the new, the new Greencastle High School opened in 1969, uh, eventually someone bought the old school and turned it into condos. But there are very many happy memories there. There were neighborhood grocery stores back in 1940 in Greencastle. About every two or three blocks, there would be a little grocery store. Now, bear in mind that the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor on December the 7th, 1941. So all during my high school, my elementary school career, we were at war. And that made a difference in the community. And one thing that I remember, and I wish I did not remember, was the flags in the windows of the families who had soldiers serving in the United States Army in the European theater or in the South Pacific. You could buy a star at the G.C. Murphy dime store display, which was just inside the east door of the store. You hung a blue star in your window if you had a son or a daughter in the service. And many families had two or three brothers in the service. You hung a, a gold star 80 years ago, and it still makes me cry. You hung a gold star in your window if your child had been killed in the war. And there were plenty of gold stars hanging in Greencastle windows. And when you put that in the perspective as a kid, you know the families who were involved, and you think about some of those guys who walked the floors of Miller School or Ridpath School or went to Old Bloody Jones just like you're doing, and they never came home. They were heroes. And um, 
People were proud to serve. It was a different mindset than we have today. And uh, later on in life, I will skip several years to, to talk about the Hodshire family. Mrs. Hodshire was one of my Avon customers. She lived on Highland Street in Greencastle. Um, I liked to visit her because she didn't have very many people coming to her home. Her home was spotless. I think a, a fleck of dust would have stopped at the door and said, I never am coming into this house. She wouldn't have me. But she was always very kind and cordial. And there was a picture of her son who was in the service on the piano. But she, she never she really dwelt on that. Well, this is my son, and he was in the service. And just a few years ago, I found out that her son was on the USS He was on the USS Indianapolis, and that's the ship that took the A-bomb to Japan and later was sunk by the Japanese, and he perished. Uh, and all, all that time that I visit her, her as her Avon representative who bought my Avon moisture cream, she could never quite get around to saying that. And I, I, I felt so sorry when I found out what had happened. And then one day I was nosing around in Forest Hill Cemetery here in Greencastle, and not too far from where my parents and grandparents are buried is the Hodger Stone. And it's, it's Mr. and Mrs. Hodger, and then across the bottom of the stone, um, in memory of our son who was on the USS Indianapolis. And, um, now that I have children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, I think of how People must have felt when they were at the train station sending their kids off to war. Um, that was difficult, but as kids, uh, our, our parents tried not to dwell on the war. Uh, and I'm glad for that, though both of my parents had businesses that were open 24 hours a day. My mother ran the Monon Grill, which is now a second-hand store along what used to be the Monon Tracks. My parents opened that in February of 1940. There had been a restaurant called the Monon Cafe there many years ago, and um, that was the first prefabricated building in Greencastle. My dad's garage is where Wasser Brewing is now. I think that brewery is a great testament to a man who drank a lot of beer. But they, he bought the garage in 1935. It became the Triple A Agency. He had a big record, which was very busy. It was open 24 hours a day. And so my parents were always busy during the war. But there was always war talk at the tables, and we had, uh, our little dinette area had a big map of Europe, probably about four feet square, 48 by 48, on one wall of the dinette, and on the other wall was the map of the South Pacific area. My mother had employed a lot of people at the restaurant who were in the service. And one of my early memories of her is sitting at her desk upstairs writing to all of the people who had worked for her at the Monon Grill. And someplace in our old house is a shoebox full of letters that those guys had written back. And they were heavily, the word I think now is redacted. There were things crossed out. They couldn't tell where they were just that they were, and to tell everybody hello. Well, the news got around town at the little neighborhood grocery stores. There were two neighborhood grocery stores at, by Miller School. One of them was, um, what was his name? Lee Wilson, and his store was on Bloomington Street, just a little one-room store 
approximately where the motel is now. The other store was Inman's store, and they were South Arlington Street between Seminary and Anderson Street. Binkley's had a store in Fox Ridge. In the north, Lockwood Street on West Liberty Street, west of the old Jones School. Everybody loved to go to Lockheed's. That's where all the news was. For a while, after the uh, trailer park came into being on North Madison Street, one of the Pingletons had a grocery store there. Hardman's had a grocery store on North Jackson Street, where the laundromat is now, long in there someplace. On South Jackson Street, there was Gould's Market. On Berry Street, we had Roland's Grocery Store. In the South Grocery Store and Hedges Market, there are descendants of those families in Greencastle, Putnam County area now. And the, the local dairy, Handy's Dairy, would make deliveries to those stores and the Handy's delivery guys were the, the, the grapevine. They would go from one store to the next with news of the boys in service and who died and when the funeral's going to be and all the latest gossip. And also we had an Omar bakery here. Omar delivered baked goods, breads and cupcakes and all kinds of bakery things. And, and the Omar man also made deliveries out in the county. And he was another good source of neighborhood gossip. The community was about 5,000 strong then. And it was a lot, it was more compact and much closer or closely knitted, I guess would be the best way to say that. A lot more people went to church back then. We didn't have as many churches, but the ones that we did have were very well representative. The Putnam County Fair met first on the north side of the Courthouse Square and later, uh, during the, before the war sometime, it moved out to Roban Park. And now what is one of the shelter houses was the old sheep barn and the women's stuff and the girls 4-H stuff was all in what was then the Miller School. How I strived, oh, to stitch everything just right. I was not a good seamstress, but I was pretty good in baking and, and food preparation. And of course, with that, what you, what you can't display, you can always eat. So there was always light at the end of that tunnel. And the livestock displays were on the grounds of the fairgrounds, and it had a carnival. And the carnival was set up where the baseball diamond is now. And on Sunday morning, after the carnival, people wrapped up late Saturday night and left town. All the kids in my Sunday school class at First Christian made a mad dash to Roban Park to look for coins on the baseball field where the carnival had set up. And we usually came home with maybe 30 cents a piece. And that was a fine then because during the war, um, you could buy two hamburgers and a Coke for five, 25 cents. Cokes were a nickel. Hamburgers were 10 cents a piece. And kids who could not or would not take their lunch to Miller School and have lunch lunch with the school people went to a little restaurant called the Rendezvous, which was kind of a DePaul College hangout. And it was on the end of Anderson Street. It was the second building east, no, no, second building west of Bloomington Street on Anderson. And that's how I know that you could get two hamburgers and a Coke for 25 cents. I don't remember what my folks charged for 
meals at the Monon, but I remember talk about a 35 cent blues, blue, place, blue plate special. Sometimes troop trains came through and my folks, had, my mother, uh, of course, was in charge and she didn't do any cooking. Uh, and I think she was, you know, she was there during the day to keep an eyeball on things and uh, greet people and, and those kinds of things. Uh, she was more of a business person. Uh, but the government would call the train station and the train station master would come over and say, we've got a, a train load of guys going to Louisville and we need X number of sandwiches by whatever time. I don't know how they did that. Uh, but I do know that food was hard to get. It was rationed. I still have some of my folks' ration books and stamps. Shoes were rationed. Car tires were rationed. Gasoline was rationed. But it was all part of the war effort. And I, I realize I'm chattering on and on about the war. Uh, but as I get older and look back to how we view our current situation and how things were then, how different our attitudes are, and how different we react to some of the things that go on in our country. Um, I cannot imagine Franklin Roosevelt ever calling anybody a name. That would not have happened. I can, uh, war hero Dwight Eisenhower came back to be president of the United States of America. He was the head of the whole European op occupation. He was a gentleman. He had been through hell, but he didn't go to Washington and call people names. People just behaved a whole lot better then. And I don't know whether that's good or bad. It's just different. But growing up in Greencastle was warm and safe. We had Boy Scouts. We had Girl Scouts. We had a huge 4-H program. I love being part of that. Again, you know, you could always eat the mistakes. So that was, and I look back and think of, I'm diabetic now, and I think of making Kool-Aid at the 4-H meeting. <laughs> Excuse me. We poured two cups of sugar into a powder mix and added water and drank it. Oh, oh mercy. It clogs my arteries now just, just to think about it. But that's what everybody did. And uh, we had big Girl Scouts and, and those people also had programs during the summer. And uh, I was very familiar with the Girl Scout program because we got to go to McCormick's Creek State Park and spend two glorious weeks in the cabins. And my mom was on this, the Scout Council and she was also running the, the Monon Grill, so she was able to buy food for the camp. And one year she got a buy on canned figs from the Sexton Company. I had never eaten a fig in my life. I had no idea what a fig was. But she got a great buy on figs, and I think I know why nobody would eat them. But <laughs> we had figs at Girl Scout camp one week. It seemed like uh, every, every meal for a week had a fig in it someplace, and uh, they ran out by the end of the second week. But one of the girls had taken an old formal for our, our skits after regular camp programs were over, and she appeared as the fig lady with things <laughs> taped to her body and with a face that would stop a clock. But the rest of the food that my mom got for the Girl Scout camp was pretty good. She dealt with the Sexton Company, and uh, two weeks away from home was a new experience. Uh, there were kids in camp whose folks could not afford to send them for two weeks, but they had a program called a camper ship. And local folks um, pitched in money to, girls, to the Girl Scout Council 
so that every girl who wanted to go to camp could. We all took our own bedrolls, uh, and for people who had to go together in, in two or three cars and, and couldn't take their bedrolls to camp, they brought them to our front porch, and my dad loaded them up in his pickup truck and drove them to McCormick's Creek State Park over that rickety old bridge over the White River. And there were lots of girls in cars who got down between the two seats because they were terrified and couldn't bear to look out that rickety old bridge down to the White River, which of course looked like Niagara Falls. Uh, so those were happy memories of the kinds of things that we did in Greencastle during the 1940s. It was a fun place to live. The community was closely knit. And when the war was over, everybody gathered on the courthouse square. And the college bell rang and rang and rang, and, and the, the places with heavy equipment came to town and, and drove around. And uh, it was a great and glorious celebration. And my dad had fusees, uh, the little torch-like things that they put out when you had a record call and, and needed to tell people to, to slow down. There was a mess ahead. Somebody went over to the garage and got a bunch of those things and carried them around like the Statue of Liberty. So uh, living in Greencastle as a from zero to maybe age 10 or 12 was a great experience. Our parents were indulgent. They did things for us. We pretty much well behaved. I jumped off Crow's Bridge at the age of 10. <laughs> I'm really proud of that. But my, my contemporaries, the guys, were diving off the top. I was terrified to do that. My father had to bribe me with a quarter if I would jump off the floor of the bridge. And he was in the river down to the bottom. I'll catch you. Come on, jump. My mother was sitting on the bank in a camp school yelling, don't let her do that. Don't let her do that. I think I get a quarter. <laughs> I jumped off the bridge. So those, those are the kind of, of happy childhood memories that we had in Greencastle back in the 1940s. It was a good place to live, and I'm delighted that I had an opportunity to be a part of that. Greencastle, Indiana, 1940s.